This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. And today we're going to be looking at five things to know about anaphylaxis in the school setting. Our five things to know series is presented by Allergy and Asthma Network to share our thoughts about issues that are important to patients and providers. The uh, today's five things to know include anaphylaxis 102, that's a little bit more than 101. And uh, we're gonna look at auto injector issues. We have a section called parents, staff, and administrators, oh my. We're gonna do some frequently asked questions and then we're gonna finish up today talking about tips and tricks. So for those of you that don't know me, I spent most of my career as a school nurse. I spent years at the health office desk in elementary and secondary, both public and private schools. I know what it's like to think you've seen it all until you come to work the next day and find something new and unusual every day. Before coming to the network, I served as Director of Nursing Education for the National Association of School Nurses, and before that, served as Executive Director for the New York Statewide School Health Services Center. I've had the opportunity to work on local, state, and national guidance on anaphylaxis. I'm proud to be part of Allergy and Asthma Network, and this year we're celebrating our 35th year of supporting patients and families. We're a grassroots patient advocacy organization that began at a mom's kitchen table when she couldn't find support for allergies and asthma in her family, and I just think that's so cool. But our mission is to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. We do this by working with experts in the field of allergy and asthma. And today we welcome an expert in the field, as well as a member of our board, to talk about anaphylaxis. Sandy Moritz is a nationally certified and experienced school nurse and school nurse coordinator who has extensive experience in addressing challenging school health issues. Sandy was honored as a Pennsylvania School Nurse of the Year and is a frequent presenter at national NASN conferences and state conferences and workshops. Sandy's a member of our board because she is passionate about patient teaching and sees an educated patient as empowered to create a healthy life. Well, Sandy, welcome so much today to the program. Thank you so much, Sally. It's my honor to be here with my nurse colleagues and friends of the school health team. Uh, I'm looking at your picture and I'm thinking, I kind of want to enjoy that sunny day with you. But it is a sunny, a sunny day today. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we're going to get going on our presentation and Sandy will join it in just a little bit. Uh, I, may, I have something that we want to say before we get going. And that's that to, we're going to have a lot to say today on the webinar that's experiential and, and basically all it's, it's based on best practices as well as our personal experience. But we want to make sure you remember that you have to exercise independent professional judgment when you assimilate anything into your practice. Because nurse practice acts are going to differ from state to state, you have to make sure that anything related to practice is consistent with the state laws and regulations in your state, including those governing delegation as well as applicable school district policies and procedures. So as part of our little disclaimer here, we hope you find these tips helpful. We're not outlining a full allergy and anaphylaxis management program today in this webinar, but we are gonna to touch on aspects of anaphylaxis management at school. So we're gonna start with a few allergy facts just to get us going. And I just want you to think about which ones on this chart kind of surprise you. And you know, one in 12 children have food allergies. So that means that in an average classroom, you're gonna see two children with a food allergy. The average annual cost of food allergies is $24.8 billion. And when you see children with food allergies, 29% of those are going to have the comorbidity of asthma. And, and that's a significant number. And if you have asthma, it does make an anaphylactic reaction more severe. 25% of food allergy rea reactions occur in students that don't have a previous diagnosis of an allergy. And that's obviously significant for school nursing practice. There are 150 to 200 fatalities every year from food allergies, 40 fatalities due to insect stings, 400 fatalities due to medication allergy, and no one should die from anaphylaxis. And that's a lot of why we're around as school nurses and healthcare providers. 
another interesting little fact is that one to six percent of Americans have a latex allergy. So as we move on in our in our chat about anaphylaxis, Sandy's going to take us on a little tour of anaphylaxis 102. Here we go. Yes, anaphylaxis 102. You know, those facts were very interesting. And two that jumped out at me, Sally, uh, was the fact that 25% of students that are going to have an allergic reaction have not been previously identified. And I believe that's a big concern for us as school nurses because we have to be alert for those that have the diagnosis, but then also we have to realize it could just happen to anyone. So that was a great fact to see and get reinforced. So what is anaphylaxis? Well, we all have a pretty good idea, I think, of what it is, but what does it mean? I believe anaphylaxis means that we have to be ready for a complex situation which may develop. It's not always black or white, in my professional opinion. And my experience with um, treating anaphylaxis about 15 times with epinephrine in the school setting is that it wasn't always so clear. It didn't happen just like the chart may show us. So I think we have to be prepared for something that's complex and maybe difficult to recognize, especially if a student has a comorbidity such as asthma. Is it asthma? Is it anaphylaxis? Is it something else? This is where our assessment skills, I think, are invaluable and the experiences that we have had with dealing with anaphylaxis. One other thing I want to mention about anaphylaxis in general is that it is very unpredictable. Someone may have had an allergic reaction to a particular substance and the next time is exposed and may have a very different reaction or none at all, or the opposite could happen. I think we do preparation as school nurses very well. And I also want to mention that in our school health office, we have team members who may not actually be nurses. We know our schools do not staff full-time nurses in every building, every day, all day. So I welcome anyone who is here today listening um, about anaphylaxis who may be working with students when the school nurse may be at another location or not in or is out ill possibly. But what is it actually, what are we gonna see? We usually will see a sudden onset. Although again, unpredictable, that may not be the case. It could be delayed anaphylaxis. The drop in blood pressure, you know, we're taught as school nurses and as nurses in general, check those vital signs. But this is a time when you want to actually grab the epinephrine if you think it's anaphylaxis and not the blood pressure uh, kit right away. Later on, when you go to check vital signs, if you have a chance to after the administration and care of the student or staff member, the blood pressure may already have come up a bit from the administration of epinephrine. But if we were to have it checked right away, we would see that drop because they're actually going into shock. And yes, almost any system of the body can be affected. And in schools where we're on the outlook more for food allergies, you will actually see a more rapid um, advance to that serious um, respiratory or cardiac arrest from sting, uh, stingers that are happening you know, on the playground. And we go back to school, hopefully before um, the fall, but even in the spring, the bees are out and so on. And the good news is children come to us right away after they've been stung. But if they're having symptoms of a food allergy, they may well be into those 30 minutes before we see them because they may not recognize the symptoms or the staff members may not have recognized what is going on and they already are at that critical moment or so where they could be going into a serious reaction. So what plan should I use? Well, I think we need all of the plans actually. So that medical emergency response plan is that sort of general plan that the school has. We used to call it the code blue, and now we've changed it to something more specific so that there is no confusion. If we hear medical emergency announced in the school, we'll be anticipating that we may hear the ambulance siren so that probably no one will be too surprised. The medical emergency or MERP, as we call it, lets us know what we're going to do in general, like who can call 911? 
of course, anyone. Those um, instructions may be by the telephones, and that would be helpful, I think, for all of our staff. It also lists on there usually who our team members are, who's going to help the nurse, who's going to help the person in the school health office. The school nurse, as the school medical expert, should stay with the victim, staff, student, visitor, whatever it is, and give the care. And the team members support the school nurse at her direction. So they may be greeting the ambulance and doing other tasks, getting 911 call, depending on the situation, contacting the parents. So those team members are also listed on that um, team response medical emergency plan and what some of the responsibilities are. And then, of course, our other plan, you see the front side of that, the um, American Academy of Pediatrics Allergy and Anaphylaxis Emergency Plan, which I really like because it's a plan for any type of allergic response, not just what maybe our old plans were just for foods. So we have the MERP, we have our individual plan, and our district should be supporting these plans and be aware what they are. What should we do and how should we do it? And that's all detailed there. And then of course we have our national support from National Association of School Nurses. And I would you know, suggest that if possible to be a member in most states, if you're a member of the national organization, you're also usually a member of your state organization, where you can get a lot of support online and at the conferences that are held usually every year. And so here's a sample protocol. It is on the website of NASEN and you can actually access this and many other toolkits they have without actually being a member. So some things you must be a member to access, but this you must not, you do not need to be. And it's a great um, point to present to your administration also if you're still developing a plan like that plan a lot and also what i like about that plan is that it details about the training that school nurses usually have to do for the staff members one thing we really need with the training is time to train we need more than five minutes on that first faculty day uh, when we're having a faculty meeting and then it gets turned over to the school nurse and everyone is just raring to get back into their rooms to get ready for students the next day or so and the school nurse feels like she rapidly has to go through training process. So we really do need the time. Now under the treatment. Um, treatment, I think this, plant, this um, particular slide is excellent because everything on there, if we present this information to our staff, I think it simplifies what they need to do. First, fast, epinephrine. No, don't worry about Benadryl. We're not worrying about that at all, period, unless we have time while we're waiting for the ambulance. If it's anaphylaxis, if you think, think that's what it is, it probably is, and get ready to administer it. You've had the training. You can emphasize to your staff you know enough. You really do know enough to sort of boost their confidence levels because they're not medically trained. And so I think a lot of them are very fearful Will I do the right thing? Will I put it in the right spot? And you can just really emphasize with them that yes, you will. You will do just fine if you have to do it yourself. And if you're not in the building, it may be a staff member that has to do it. And also emphasize that you're not going to do any harm. Is it asthma? Is it um, allergies, a severe anaphylactic reaction? Epinephrine is not going to do harm in either of those situations. In fact, it may save the life, and so we can emphasize that too. I just love this chart. It is available for the Health Office on Allergy and Asthma Network's uh, website, and you can see that we have an almost endless supply of products. Others not even on there is, for instance, the old violin syringe. How I first gave epinephrine was to a staff member with a bee sting reaction with the old anakit, which, which, which was a pre-filled syringe with a needle attached on the end. My order said I could give it to a staff member who was having anaphylaxis to the flu shot. Yes, I had to actually give it and not have an order for it my very first week as a school nurse 30 some years ago. The good news is she was just fine after receiving it. 
The other good news is it was available as a stock medication even way back when. The bad news is I had to then get an appropriate order to be able to use it in the future. So the violent syringe is missing there. You'll see the hold times uh, to keep it in the muscle varies from two to three seconds, except for the impacts generic auto injector. Um, and so it's a very helpful tool to have in your office to refer to. The SimJepi is not an auto injector. It is actually a pre-filled syringe. Care of the student. I was reminded um, after giving epinephrine to a student one day that I was taking care of anaphylaxis and not the student. At one point while we were waiting for the ambulance and she was doing quite well, she looked at me and she said, Mrs. Moritz, don't look so worried. I realized that I was taking care of anaphylaxis and not her. And um, on realizing that, I started to um, deal more with her emotional support. She said, it's okay. You know, I have another leg and I have another shot if I need it. So she was very reassuring to me, but she brought me back to the fact that um, we are dealing with children. They're relying on us to take care of them. Um, and sometimes we have to remember that, you know, by the way, this is a person. And then when the parent comes in, of course, usually students start to react a little bit differently. But I will say that calming is contagious. If we're calm, our student will be calm. Those helping us will be calm. And when the parent comes in, we can help to calm them. We can say things like, this will help you feel better. I'm here to help you. We will call your parents, don't worry. Um, you're with that patient. You can give them a squeeze um, ball, or I saw the dollar store has them when we're able to go there, but it may be online. Little squeeze oranges, ask them to squeeze some orange juice, give them a stuffed animal, um, help them to stay calm. Um, you can certainly use touch. Touch is a therapeutic tool. Maintaining their airway, the ABCs, of course, very tantamount in a medical emergency, and this is a respiratory emergency many times for our students. I like to give the epinephrine when they're lying down because I want to keep them lying down. So if you can do that, that will um, make a better outcome for your child, uh, for your student. And also have them lie on their side if they feel nauseated at all. Get a waist can. We're used to doing that, elevating the legs um, and providing privacy. This doesn't always happen in our offices where we can close the door. It may happen in a hallway or a classroom. If we're having a medical emergency, we don't want to have the nosy neighbors and everybody watching everything that's happening to us. So a privacy foil blanket, you can get those, they're very easy and very inexpensive, or a blanket in your first aid bag comes in handy and one of your staff members can hold that up for some privacy. And then you can use it also to keep the student warm. Just remember, you might need that second dose of epinephrine, so it's very important to continue to assess those ABCs. And the transport to the hospital should be as soon as possible. Before you give the epinephrine, and yes, just one last thing, I keep thinking one more thing to add, um, explain to the student what you're going to do, and of course, get your staff to help you immobilize um, before you attempt to administer. With students that have had an epinephrine injection before, especially if they're older, like in our high school, um, you can actually ask them, do you want me to help you, assist you in this, so that they have a chance to learn how to actually administer it. And you can put your hand over theirs on the auto injector to help guide them if they are um, confident enough and want to do that. Thanks, Sally, for going back to that. Oh, no problem. Uh, you, you made me think of so many things as you were talking. And you were talking about uh, calmness is contagious. And I just remembered one of my principals that I worked for said that he knew we were in really big trouble if my voice got very calm and sing-songy. He thought, oh, now we're really, we really got a problem going. Yeah. But, uh, but we always do need to try to find a way to put on that calm. So we're going to talk a little bit about talking to parents and staff and administrators and enlisting cooperation. And I think one of the biggest things we can do is really work hard to build trusting relationships. Because once an emergency is happening, 
it's not the moment to decide you really want people to trust you. You have to build that in advance. So in every interaction with parents and staff and administrators, make sure that what you're doing is building that trust that they will have in you when the moment of emergency comes. And so many times I think that, uh, you know, a parent or even administrator might say something that you think is a little um, outrageous or, you know, your first reaction is, are you kidding? I think a great response is, well, we want the same thing. How can I help? And making sure then that you sometimes bring them around to what the guidance is of what is evidence-based to do. This is always easy to say, and it's not always easy to do, but just try to remember that every interaction counts. And when you're thinking about building trust, don't forget the student. One time I was working with a, a middle school girl and I told her that if she had a problem, I could even bring her epinephrine auto injector to the classroom. And she said, you would do that in the classroom? And I said, sure, we can do it in the classroom. And she went she, white as a ghost. And I said, what would bother you about that? And she said, well, my mom always pulls my pants down. I was like, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that in my classroom. <laughs> and so, so we had to make sure that, that she knew that it could go right through her pants. But you never know what people's reactions are going to be. So that as you're trying to build trust with parents, the biggest thing to do is listen. Parents are working 24 seven to keep these, their children with a food allergy or, or any other kind of allergy that's at risk for being a life-threatening situation. They're working so hard. So I think it, you know, meeting with these parents at the beginning of the school year, if needed, is, is a great idea. And I think it's a really good idea too that as they're telling you things, don't ever start an answer with, we can't do that. You know, if they say, I want every school student in the school to wash their hands before lunch, you might be thinking, oh, no, we can't do that. But find a way to say, well, that's an interesting idea. Well, now the evidence tells us that, you know, allergies are spread by and then start moving things the way you think they ought to be going. But always build that bridge, help bring them to, to the side of evidence-based practice and, and work really hard to find solutions together. I think, you know, when you're a, in more of a partnership relationship with a parent, that goes such a long way. And I would just like to mention that the really cute picture on this page just happens to be my daughter and two of my grandkids. But uh, there we go. I don't know anybody on the rest of the slides. They're all stock pictures, but that one wasn't. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to build trust with your staff. And again, listen, make sure that they, be, you know, that you help them to build confidence in caring for kids. You want to share information in a confidential but collegial way. Uh, back in the 70s, we weren't allowed to really put out those, those confidential health lists, but you can go to a team meeting and talk about the children and let them take notes. So find creative ways to make sure that you're giving them the information that they need and, and ask them what they need. Uh, another great idea is to remember to do is to avoid gossip. And the, the other thing that I think happens way too often is that people want to talk about students in the hallway. And these kids deserve respectful confidentiality of their health issues. So make sure that you're showing respect while you're following uh, the, uh, the guidance about their legal rights. But really building trust with the staff goes a long way. And then your administrator. Again, listen to what their concerns are. And, and the other thing I think it's really important with administrators is always providing them with information before somebody else does. I used to think, you know, as there were occasionally uh, parent interactions and I thought, yeah, you're gonna go to the principal, I know. You're not really fond of what I just said. But I'd always make sure I got to him first and I would tell him, this happened today, you might hear about it. And, and that allows the principal to look like they've got credibility that they know what's going on in their building. But it also lets them know your side of the story. And, uh, and make sure you know they know you have their back because then they'll have yours. And again, too, another important thing to do is demonstrate your value. Make sure when there's an emergency that you talk to them after the fact, debrief it about what you did and the medical basis that you, you planned your assessments on and your interventions. And make sure they know that this is nursing practice. And it's not just like, you are in a convenient spot at the right time. And I think that is a really important thing to remember to do. So what do all of these groups need to know? They need to know how to prevent exposures. They need to know what to do in the event that there's an emergency. In your school, you have to know who can administer epinephrine, 
where is it? You want to make sure it's not locked up, but that it's still secure. You want people to know how to use an emergency care plan. You want to make sure that people know federal laws and student rights. And you also want to make sure that everybody remembers always to provide emotional support for children who might witness anaphylaxis. Even if it's not happening to them, it can make a big difference in how they feel about themselves and health and safety. So Sandy. Those are some great points, Sally. Just to, to go back a little bit about some of, of my experience with parents, I noticed that um, when parents bring their children to us for the first time, let's just say it's kindergarten, um, they are so anxious if they have a child that has experienced anaphylaxis or they think may experience anaphylaxis, and they're handing their greatest asset over to the school, and it takes a while for them to feel like, we know enough that they can trust us. And their first interaction is probably going to be with the school nurse presenting those auto injectors and the plan. And so we have this big opportunity to make it as smooth as possible and let them know that their anxiety is normal. Of course, they would be anxious about it because they don't know us, they don't know what we know, they may not know our laws. Um, so I think we have that big opportunity to, to help parents feel better and that, you know what, I think this is going to be okay. We're going to have meetings. We're going to figure it out. Everybody will know what to do to keep their student, their child stay safe at school. Um, and then with the staff members, I just want to say that I often would emphasize to them, you are my first set of eyes, making them feel but they're very important because they are going to maybe be the first to witness something unusual with that child to get them to us as soon as possible. So the staff, we need them because we're not in the classroom all the time uh, with the students like they are. And then finally, our administrators. I agree with you, Sally. I would hate um, if my principal, on a rare occasion that did happen, would come in and, and mention to me, I wish you had told me this. And then I realized that maybe it was a busy day, a chaotic uh, day, and you just didn't make it down to the principal's office um, to let them know about something. So keeping them in the loop is really important, all of those factors, so that we're all rowing in the same direction. All right, storage. What is epinephrine? What is epinephrine anyway? Well, it's really a hormone our body makes called adrenaline from the adrenal glands. But now we're going to be giving a boost of epinephrine when we give the auto injectors or epinephrine um, in, a, in some other way to the student who's having anaphylaxis. Adrenaline comes in a one milligram per milliliter dosage um, for ep anaphylaxis due to allergy reactions. There are other formulas of adrenaline for other medical emergencies. So if you're by any chance ordering it by the vial, I noticed in some of the catalogs, the different strengths are there. And adrenaline um, was also called aqueous epinephrine, one to 1,000. So make sure it's the correct strength if you're ordering a vial and a syringe. And of course, your school physician should know that too. So these are all the things that it does. And what it is doing actually when we administer it, it is changing the course. It is going back to more the normal C um, because we're administering a fight or flight hormone, just like our normal adrenaline is. We want to stop that reaction to the allergic situation. And of course, you have heard this over and over again, epinephrine first, epinephrine fast. It's not the time to pick up the phone and have a conference call with the parent and ask them, do you think I should give epinephrine? I've heard school nurses saying that because they're afraid if they give it and the parent says, oh, you should have waited for me, or um, are you sure they really needed it? No, you're the medical expert. You've decided it's anaphylaxis. There's no other recourse then except to get epinephrine out and give it to them quickly. Um, have someone call 911 if you haven't already, and then the parents get notified. And then at that point, you'll be able to, or someone will say to them, the ambulance is coming, they've had epinephrine, they're doing better is hopefully what you would say, we're monitoring them. Um, and then that whole conversational loop of, I'll be right in, I wanna see how they are before you get, give epinephrine 
does not occur. And of course, giving any medication, we wanna make sure we're following the five R's of medication administration, starting of course with the right person, the right medication, the right dose, the right amount, the right dose, the right location, um, and which one did I forget, Sally? I had them written down, I can't find that particular note. Right child, right medication, right dose, right location, which will be the vastus lateralis, and the right time, and of course it's a PRN medication. Uh, we have the prescriber's order on the uh, allergy action plan from AAP, the latest one. And many times um, nurses will ask, well, how much should I give them if I'm not sure what their weight is? Well, we know that the protocol is 66 pounds, but you can actually find their weight by measuring them from the top of their head to the sole of their foot using the Braslau tape. And that's something you can look into, especially if you have your own vial of epinephrine or it's a first event and you don't actually know what the child's weight is. So we're not going to be taking the time to weigh the child. Um, and most research will say that if the dose has been upsized a bit, that it probably is not going to have a negative effect. All right, epinephrine storage. A couple of points on that. If you have an auto injector and it's expired, what should you do? Well, hopefully um, you've used the tracking form and um, Allergy and Asthma Network has it actually in one of their documents um, on the website. Um, but for the most part, make sure it's clear and not yellow or cloudy looking. Um, if it's the only thing you have, then you're going to have to go ahead and use that expired auto injector. But that's why I think stock is just so important to have on hand. We are tracking expiration dates, but every now and then something may get away from you. But if you have that stock, you should have a form right there and you should be uh, logging in, you know, periodically, at least monthly to make sure that it has not expired. Where are these injectors when um, the school is empty? What temperatures are they kept at right now when no one is in school? They may have lowered the heat. Um, in our southern states, the heat may be going up in the buildings and the AC is not on. So that 66 uh, to 77 degrees might not be maintained. And that would not be a good idea. So somebody needs to be keeping track of that. Um, possibly somebody is still in the office and you could ask them to do it. So the stock epinephrine um, initiative, which has been heralded by Allergy and Asthma Network and other organizations, is now available in every state except Hawaii. And laws are different. So whatever state you're in, you have to be aware of what your law is and you're, you can access your actual um, the number of, of that initiative, that law in your state by accessing the forms on Allergy and Asthma Network in their toolkit. Um, it's marvelous what's in there. It's almost as though they have done almost everything you need to do other than administer it um, in that toolkit. So I would suggest that you take a good look at that. And those are some of the things that are in the toolkit. There you'll see the steps to stock and the policy is something you should be involved in creating with your school district. I was always very appreciative when I was invited to the meeting and not given the policy after somebody forgot to invite me because you have important things about these medical policies to contribute. And then the protocol, who's going to do the training? When is it going to be done? Where are the injectors going to be, especially the stock, the prescription from your doctor, um, it's, there's something in that uh, toolkit the doctor just fills out and then partnership, partnerships with other organizations where you might be able to get free stock and so on. And then your staff education and training and you are part of that training. You're probably the significant part of that training. Um, and I believe that is um, pretty much what's in that toolkit, including the sample emergency plan. So take a look at that on Allergy and Asthma Network's website. I love this school nurse's idea of how to um, display the designated auto injectors. In fact, some students have their inhalers in there also if they have a diagnosis of asthma. Their care plan copy is right in there. 
you can pick that up right off of uh, the wall and transport it to a site um, where maybe students are after school for a program. Um, it should not be locked up in the school nurse office, but if you have your stock out and about, and we'll talk a little bit about more where you can locate that stock epinephrine, um, you'll have um, the stock then available for anyone if you don't have the designated auto injectors moving uh, along with where the students are. And of course, some students may and should be carrying their auto injector. Multiple pens in the school. We used Velcro to put a pen on the wall by the principal's phone, by the cafeteria, cashier's um, register, and also in the gym. So it's up to you, really. It's a personal choice. So Sally, are you taking this one on should schools ban peanuts? Now? Um, I can hear you now. Okay. 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 So uh, th this is the one, uh, should school ban peanuts? And we, we talked to Dr. Michael Pistoner, who works at Mass General for the answer to this question. And the, this question says that the goals for school is to prevent children with food allergies from coming into contact with the food that they are allergic to and potentially have a severe allergic reaction. Saying a school is peanut free doesn't mean that appropriate food allergy management is in place. And in fact, it's been shown that designations of banning peanuts or another food can actually decrease vigilance on the part of the staff, which would increase exposures. And if adequate staff training does not occur, that's such a key. The key is to train staff and establish protocols to avoid accidental exposures to any known allergen. The student's developmental capabilities and school resources should be considered when considering specific allergen restriction that might be implemented in addition to the effective staff, staff training and policy implementation that can apply to all children with food allergies. So that's Dr. Pistner's answer to should school ban peanuts. Okay, the next question was, why wouldn't a school have stock epi? We know that not only do some schools not have stock epi, we know that some could have stock epi and have not chosen to implement it. And uh, the answer came for this question, we went to Ann Connolly, who's a state school nurse consultant in Ohio. And Ann said that some schools are concerned about the cost of procuring, maintaining, and replacing either used or expired epinephrine auto injectors. And sometimes school staff are unwilling to be trained to use them. And some just are, con are concerned about liability regarding administration to a student who's actually not experiencing anaphylaxis or a lack of administration to a student who is administer experiencing it. And so I thank you so much, Ann, for that answer. But the other thing to keep in mind is, um, I think that school nurses should really push to have stock epi fully implemented in their school because uh, first of all, it's the right thing for kids. I mean, they, uh, you're, uh, you can save a life with stock epi. And also nurses don't face that horrible moment of this child needs epinephrine. They don't have a, a designated injector. I'm gonna to have to either do something outside of my scope of practice or possibly watch them die. Stock epi takes that off your plate. And the other thing to keep in mind too is that uh, if a parent were to find out that you could have had it and you didn't and they lost their child, I think that'd be a bigger liability issue than any other. So be thinking about all those things when you're thinking about schools that have not implemented stock epi. I agree 100%. Stock saves lives. I Yes, well, we both agree on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. So our next question, we went to Dr. Matthew Greenhout, who works at the University of Colorado for this answer. And the answer, the question is, are allergic reactions caused by exposure in the air and through the skin? I think this is just a huge issue for school nurses. And, uh, and I love Matt, but his answer was too long to get on one slide. So I'm going to read to you the answer that he sent me in an email. He says, skin contact is not a significant risk for a reaction, but can result in a localized reaction 
such as contact hives or some other rash, or resulting in nothing. Localized skin reactions have not no been noted to become generalized into a full body reaction, and in fact can usually resolve quickly if the area is washed off. There was a case of a child in the United Kingdom who had cheese thrown at him, and the event resulted in a fatality. It's a, still a very complex and still unclear situation, and should be viewed as very much an exception and an anomaly, not what is remotely likely to happen. Airborne reactions are also of remote likelihood to happen. There are a few published cases of fish or shellfish allergic individuals inhaling steam from these items being cooked who had a reaction, but this has not been robustly proven to occur in an experiment, and this remains more of a reported versus a demonstrated phenomenon. There are no data to substantiate that allergens, in particular peanut and tree nut, can be inhaled and cause a reaction. That is something some firmly believe is a risk, but in limited but controlled study, this has not shown to be the case. With both skin and airborne exposure, one must be aware of transfer of the allergen to a mucous membrane. So while dust in the air is of the highest likelihood to not cause a reaction, settled dust on a surface, which is inadvertently touched by the hand and then transferred to the mouth, could pose a risk. Same for any skin contact with the allergen. And here's where the most robust evidence of protection comes from. Studies have shown that hand hygiene and washing of surfaces can remove allergens. So I thought that was a very interesting and wonderful answer. So next question is, if a parent doesn't bring in epinephrine for their student, can you exclude them from a field trip? And for this answer, we went to Linda Khalil of New York State, and she uh, said, wanted to make sure that we specified that the, her answer is related to New York State laws. But these laws are also national in nature. So this answer is very likely just fine nationally. However, we'll just put the disclaimer on it of check and be sure that this is the same in your state. But in New York State, a student cannot be excluded from school or participation in a school-sponsored activity, such as a field trip, due to the lack of provision of medication by parents or guardians. In the event of an emergency, school staff would follow district emergency procedures, in call, including calling 911 because that came up a lot when I worked in New York. So uh, that was an interesting question too. And then the other question that we're talking about today is what can I use to train school staff? Well, there's some great things out there and uh, I, I don't think there's anybody more creative than school nurses, but you can go to allergyhome.org. That's uh, Dr. Mike Pistoner and Dr. John Lee have put together an amazing site. They have a school staff training module there and there's a certificate available for people to download as they've completed it. Another really cool program is FAME, which is Food Allergy Management and Education, and that came out of St. Louis Children's Hospital. I actually had the, the, uh, the privilege of working on the steering committee for this. And what's really fun about this one is there's content for the whole school community in it, and there's different sections for different uh, people, like parents, school nurses, uh, you know, teachers, uh, just all these different sections, and they're color coded. And anybody that knows me knows I can't resist anything that's color coded. Mm -hmm. But remember to be creative in your training. I used to sometimes for faculty meetings do it like an online Jeopardy, and there are templates out there, and that's kind of fun. And Sandy, why don't you share about how you use a pool noodle? Yes, yeah, so um, I got the idea from doing tourniquet training, but you can also cut a pool noodle off that's about the size of a thigh. And then you can just, with a magic marker, just show where the vastus lateralis is so that they don't give the injection to uh, anterior, to posterior, but rather laterally, right into that uh, muscle that is suggested that we administer it into. So um, I think that might make a, a nice demonstration tool for you at trainings. That's so cool. I like that. Uh, another great idea is to post facts to know in the faculty room, you know, so to kind of make sure you're dispelling some of the myths that are out there uh, and make sure because the faculty does read things during lunch occasionally, too. And another great thing to do is make rounds uh, before school. I used to, especially when I was in elementary, uh, I would try to get to school early enough that I could, before the kids got there, visit a couple of classrooms. And I'd often make sure it was of children that had allergies that put them at risk for anaphylaxis. I actually walked into one classroom one day of a child that had a very severe uh, allergy to peanuts. And the teacher was putting out a project where they were going to roll the pine cones in peanut butter and then in bird seed and make bird uh, feeders. 
And I, I said to her, what are you doing? And she, and she was like, but we're not going to eat it. And it was like, <laughs> I thought I trained better than this. But it was like, okay, educational moment. So I quickly helped her figure out a different project for that day because that one was obviously inappropriate. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about tips and tricks. And these are the things that only experience teaches you. And Sandy and I have been around the block a couple of times when it comes to the school health office. So we were going to help you a little bit with just some of our tips and tricks. So Sandy, do you want to talk about tabletop drills? Yes. So tabletop drills, think of these as scenarios. And just a couple of tips in addition to what is on this slide. Um, have a victim. Put a victim on the cot. That's where you would try to be able to give the um, epinephrine if you can. And then tell your um, team members as you're practicing with them, usually before or after school, this is anaphylaxis, what are we going to do? All right, and then watch them in action. Somebody will probably start off by calling 911, and then you'll have others picking up the slack, going and greeting the ambulance and so on, things that you've talked to them about. So these tabletop drills can be um, for anaphylaxis, and you can use a small child at the elementary building, say, okay, this is a kindergartner, middle schooler, high schooler, and so you can see your techniques may, may vary a bit depending on the uh, level. And it gives you a chance to say, what did we do well? How can we improve? And then they have a chance to ask questions too. When we have tabletop drills for those three different grade levels in the document Allergy and Anaphylaxis, a practical guide for schools and families. And that's on our website. It's a, it's a free download at allergyasthmanetwork.org. You can see right at the bottom, look for outreach, then look for special publications. Okay, the next tip I'll take. This one is don't write more into an IHP than you can actually do. Uh, certainly, certainly. So some of our children that are at risk for anaphylaxis need an IHP. Most need an emergency care plan. But if you write something down, please remember that you're legally obligated to deliver that care. Very, very good. All I can say about this is um, our AED cabinets had better move over the AED and get ready for some more things to to pop in there. If you believe your office is starting to look more like an emergency room, just accept that it is. So we can actually try to get our auto injectors, a double pack of auto injectors into our AED cabinet if there's room. You can use double backed Velcro that you can find in a sewing uh, store like Joanne Fabric or something like that. And you can Velcro almost anything to a wall using something like that. If you don't have room in there, you may have to get an extra cabinet because we have other things that might need to go in that uh, new cabinet too, like tourniquets, um, supplies for a severe bleed, Narcan, glucagon, albuterol, you name it, our emergency supplies are um, gaining speed on us and we need places to put all emergency supplies in one location with appropriate signage so everybody knows it's the AED and emergency supplies. Remember when we used to lock up our AEDs? Well, the same thing is happening. The trend for emergency supplies should be available but secure. Tips for when the EMS arrives. So you're taking good care of that child or staff member. EMS has been called. They're going to come into the office. And it's really very helpful, I think, to have a good relationship with them by greeting them and saying, hello, I'm Sandy, the school nurse. Thank you for coming. Tell them what happened. This child is, has anaphyl, had anaphylaxis. I gave the auto injector. This child also has, if the case, asthma. And the parents have been called. We had a form actually we developed where we would jot everything down. The secretary would come in, make a copy of that and the child's demographics and off the ambulance would go with all the information they needed. In addition to what you see there that we need to do, if you can check their O2 sat, if you have a pulse ox, that would be great, and then give oxygen if you have it as indicated with an order, and continue to monitor the ABCs, looking to see if they're going to maybe have a biphasic reaction and need a second injection. I love this tip. No surprises open the box. Sandy, would you like to take this one too? Uh, it's amazing what you might find in that box. You might find there is no auto injector in the box or there is only one. Um, you may see that there is no trainer and some of these auto injectors do not 
include a trainer. For instance, the impacts used to be called Adrena Click, Click does not have a trainer. Simjepi, the um, needle and syringe approach uh, that you see there on the top, does not have a trainer. You have to contact the company online and you can get free ones that way from both of those. And there you see the new Teva, where that's not actually a case, that's part of the injector and the blue clip up on the top. One thing I wanna mention, FDA did just uh, put out last week that we should be very careful when we are taking the auto injector out of the case, that would be the myelon version, number three down there, that we don't interrupt that blue cap. And that when we pull the blue cap off, we pull it off straight, not at an angle. And there you see the AVQ, which now has the third dose for infants. So make sure you know what's in there because you will get a surprise. Sometimes kids have gone in there and you may find some toys or other things. <laughs> okay, at this time, we're gonna take your questions and there are a ton of them in the box. In the box. So we will so get we going on those as quick as we can. As we can. And Sandy really just addressed this. How do we address the FDA alert regarding improperly working EpiPens? Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say be very careful. You know, you want to check it out first. See if you can get that auto injector out of that case without disrupting the blue cap, because if you do, it may prematurely um, eject the medication, and that might be into your, one of your fingers, depending on where they are at the moment. So just be very careful open the box, see what's in there, see if there's any deformity, so that you know there's time then to um, get that taken care of through the pharmacy and so on. Okay, here's someone who said, oh, somebody said, Sandy, I love her. There you go, getting some love there, Sandy. Our questions, will this webinar be archived? Yes, we are recording it, and it will be on our website within 48 hours. Okay. I'm looking for a school policy on maintaining an EpiPen in the school health office. We're not required to have one, but we do and need a policy to cover it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the toolbox that Allergy and Asthma Network has um, put together and the toolkit on NASN's website will have lots of examples of policies. And so I think you need to look at the models and take the best of those models what is going to work for you in your school district and what your administration will be able to support. Okay, uh, someone's asking about if we can uh, provide the slides. Uh, we haven't decided on if we're going to do that for this one. So uh, I'll, I'll see if I can make sure that we can do that. So someone said they noticed that the NESN EPI protocol uses 55 pounds of the weight determine whether to give the 0.15 milligram or the 0.3 milligram dose of epinephrine. All the others note 66 pounds is a cutoff. Why the difference with NASN? Well, it's not a difference with NASN alone. Uh, I, I used to make it a habit that any time I got to a, like a cocktail party with uh, allergists, I would say, so what's your cutoff weight for kids? And almost all of them said 55, one of them said 45 pounds. There is a thought that at 66 pounds, children are underdosed. So what, what's on the back of that protocol, NASN gives you the reference to where in the literature it says that it should be 55 pounds. So if you need to make, you know, kind of have something to take to your school district to say, we want 55 to be the cutoff, even though the package insert says 66, uh, you can see what you can do there. But uh, the literature, it is in the literature to these 55 pounds. So take a look for that. Yeah, and I think to piggyback on that, Sally, if you have the care plan coming through from the physician and it says 66 pounds, I think that's what we have to do. Um, but if you do want to question uh, the doctor about it and have a discussion, you can call them if you're just asking a specific question on a dosage of a medication. Cool. Somebody said they loved hearing about our experiences of, of, uh, of administering Epi. It, it's, yeah, it's, if you haven't done it, it's not hard, but it, it you know, you always think about staff members' hands shaking if they have to do it. So, yes. so someone here says, I never really gave Epi, and I'm not, I'm not so certain I would readily know how to give Epi, how to tell if there's actually no response to the first epinephrine. Well, if there's a response, it's sometimes very dramatic. The child gets so much better, so much faster, uh, which is always interesting, because that's when the ambulance or the parent shows up, is once they're all of a sudden doing really well. But 
you, you know, you kind of know that there's no response if the child doesn't improve. What would you like to say about that? Cindy? And I would say within five minutes at the most, if they're not improving, you're going to give the second injection and you can do it. You know, look at the videos, get yourself a pool noodle, practice with your trainers and an emphasis on never take a real epinephrine injector to trainers and keep your trainers and auto injectors completely separate and labeled. Cool. Okay, next question is, how many of the total annual death by anaphylaxis occurred in school? And the, the bad news is it's not measured. Uh, the mortality rate of things that happen in school are not measured. And so that, that's always something that's a little bit hard because we can't pull out that data point. That's very frustrating, but I do think we all have read about incidents that have occurred maybe, maybe in the legal um, parts of school nursing and so on, and, and they're very unfortunate, these never events, and they are many times preventable, especially if we have stock and have a way of treating them and recognizing it early. Okay, the next question is, how do you go about getting a position to partner with your district to prescribe the stock epi, especially in a very rural town? Uh, in our staff epinephrine implementation kit, there is a prescriber's toolkit that was written by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So it's written by a physician for physicians, basically. And a lot of times that reassures people tremendously. If you can't get a physician to write the prescription, try your local health department. Sometimes that works too. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, can a, rac a reaction occur if an allergen comes into contact with an open wound? Well, any mucous membrane would work, but uh, I would hope that we aren't having too many open wounds in school. But I'd say it's a possibility, but I don't see that happening very often. Okay, Sandy, here's one that people deal with a lot. Would you send a stock EpiPen along on a field trip? If the student has their personal EpiPen that gets sent, but what about the student that does not have any known allergies? Yes and yes, and send a double pack along on field trips. The staff know how to give it, how to recognize the symptoms of anaphylaxis, and if they do not have it available to them, then they may um, neglect to use student who has student who has who has, who has presented outcomes. So absolutely, stocks should go on field trips. It's an extension of the school day. So what happens in school can happen on a field trip. Okay, we have time. We've got so many questions left and I do, we just have time for like one more. So uh, someone's saying we have an after school care, but our location is locked when the administration staff leave while the students are still in, in after school care. Can we have an unlocked wall unit by the gym where the aftercare is for student EPIs? If your school yeah, wants to work that out, that's a great idea. I agree. I agree. Okay, well, Sandy, thank you so much for joining us today. I totally appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to wish everyone out there that um, is listening to have a very happy School Nurses Day. Whether you're in school nurse or not, us uh, in school or not, you are still a school nurse. And also thank you for all the extraordinary things I've been reading about school nurses doing, going back and helping out in hospitals. And um, this is a great time actually to look at your policies also and, and develop some new plans and some ideas for when we do return. But please, everyone, stay safe. Thank you, Sandy. So at this time, please download the certificate from your control panel. It's found in the handouts pane of your GoToMeeting control panel. Uh, as soon as we close the webinar, you won't be able to do that, but I am available to help you by email if you need that. Remember that there are no continuing education credits available for this webinar. So remember to please hang on for just a couple of minutes at the conclusion of the webinar. There'll be a short evaluation survey. Well, thanks for listening. Well, thanks for Our listening. next five Our things to know will be in July. July. You can register for that webinar or our COVID-19 webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education, education in the horizontal navigation environment at the top of the page, go to webinars, and you can view our archive webinars on that page on our website as well. So thanks for joining us today, and we hope you've learned five new things.
This is Sally Shuster, and for the entire staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, we hope you have a safe and a healthy day.